VOA won the hits. Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And we use words and sentences especially written for people learning English. Here are the stories we have for you on today's program. First, Brian Lynn brings us the Science and Technology Report. Today, he talks about a billionaire's goal to visit space. Then Dr. Jill Robbins brings us a technology story. Scientists have created a better way to follow birds. She will tell us more about that. Gregory Stockel tells about dinosaur bones found in Australia. We will finish with our American Presidents series, written and hosted by Kelly Jean Kelly. But first, here is Brian Lynn. Three of the founders of America's top private space companies have stated their personal desire to fly into space, but only one will be first. Jeff Bezos is head of the rocket company Blue Origin. He also founded the online store Amazon. Bezos has announced plans to make his wish come true next month on the company's first human spaceflight. If successful, the 57-year-old would become the first person to ride his own company's rocket into space. Two other founders, Elon Musk of SpaceX and Richard Branson of Virgin Galactic. Have said they also want to ride into space on a company-built spaceship. Ever since I was five years old, I've dreamed of traveling to space, Bezos said in a message announcing his plans on Instagram. He said he would be making the trip with his brother Mark. On July twentieth. I will take that journey with my brother, the greatest adventure, with my best friend," Bezos said. Joining the brothers will be at least one other passenger who is being chosen by an online auction. Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket and capsule can carry up to six people. The spacecraft will take its passengers on a ten-minute flight to about 105 kilometers above Earth. That distance is a common international definition for the beginning of space, also known as the Kármán line. The passengers are expected to spend about four minutes in this suborbital space. Where they can experience weightlessness and observe the curvature of Earth. The rocket will take off from Blue Origin's launch center in a rural area of West Texas. After the capsule separates, the reusable rocket is designed to return to Earth and land in an upright position by itself. The capsule is designed to float back to the surface with three large parachutes. Blue Origin said it has carried out fifteen successful test flights of New Shepard, but none of those carried humans. The spacecraft is named after NASA astronaut Alan Shepard, the first American to go into space. The planned launch date is July twentieth. The date was chosen because it is the fifty-second anniversary of the first moon landing by Apollo eleven astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. 
Bezos has said he will step down as Amazon's chief 15 days before the launch. Earlier, he announced that he wanted to spend more time on projects for Blue Origin. On its website, the company says its goal is to develop reusable launch vehicles for civilian and defense purposes. The Bezos flight will officially launch the company's space tourism business. The company has yet to start selling seats to the public or announce prices for the short trips. Virgin Galactic founder Branson has said he also plans to ride into space on the company's winged spacecraft later this year after one more test flight over the state of New Mexico. Virgin Galactic recently completed its third test flight into space with a crew. Like Blue Origin, Branson's company plans to send space tourists to the lower levels of space. About 600 people have already planned flights, which cost up to $250,000. Musk's SpaceX has already carried 10 astronauts to the International Space Station for NASA, the U.S. space agency. His company has also sold several seats on private space flights. SpaceX, however, has said its space tourism program aims to launch people into super-high orbit, about 800 to 1,200 kilometers above Earth. The price for those trips is expected to cost millions of dollars. Musk has not said when he might be ready to go to space himself. But he has predicted his company's reusable spacecraft called Starship will one day carry people to the moon and Mars. Musk has repeatedly said he wants to die on... Now, here is a technology story from Jill Robbins. A well-fed songbird jumps around in grass near Washington, D.C., on its back, it carries a very small, lightweight electronic device called a tag. The bird, a robin, sees an insect nearby. The bird attacks fast and wins a meal. Ecology scientist Emily Williams watches from behind a bush. On this clear spring day, she says, Now I'm watching to see whether he's found a mate. The bird has moved to a nearby tree where there is another robin. When the bird leaves, the device it carries will send data about its position to a special satellite, then back to William's computer. The Georgetown University ecologist will be able to track the animal's movement. The satellite involved is Argos. The goal of the project is to learn why some American robins travel long distances on a usual basis, or migrate, but others do not. The new tracking system promises to give more exact information about the places robins mate and raise their young and where they spend the winter. That will help scientists understand the importance of genetics versus the environment in shaping why birds migrate, Williams said. Researchers have been attaching tracking tags on birds and animals for many years. But the International Space Station and the Argos satellite now provide new ways to receive the information sent by the tags. The new system permits scientists to watch songbird movements from afar in much greater detail than before. We're in a sort of golden age for bird research, said Adrian Doctor, an ecologist at Cornell University, adding that the technology is improving 
as the tags are made smaller and smaller. We can satellite track a robin with smaller and smaller chips. Ten years ago, that was unthinkable, said the scientist, who was not involved in William's study. The device that the robin wears can report its immediate place on Earth within about ten meters. A second new device, for only the heaviest robins, provides more information about the bird's movements. Future versions may also measure the humidity and barometric pressure of the space the bird occupies. The devices are known as Icarus tags. Martin Wachelski is director of the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. His scientific team is working to improve the Icarus technology. He hopes that more and better devices could help develop what he called an Internet of Animals, a collection of sensors around the world giving us a better picture of the movement of life on the planet. The American robin is a well-known songbird in North America. Its song announces the coming of spring. Yet its migratory life remains mysterious. Ken Rosenberg is a conservation scientist at Cornell University. He says it is surprising how little we know about some of the most common songbirds. An earlier study Williams worked on showed some robins are long-distance migrants, from Alaska to Texas, while others, for unknown reasons, stay in a single place most of the year. Williams hopes more detailed data from satellite tags will answer her questions. She is working with partners who are tagging robins in Alaska, Indiana, and Florida for a three-year study. Williams has placed nets between tall poles in her yard. When a robin flies into the net, she carefully removes the bird. She measures the bird's body and pulls out a single feather to check on its overall health. Then she weighs the bird. This one is about 80 grams, just big enough to wear the satellite tag. The technology has only recently become small and light enough to use with small songbirds. Tracking devices have to weigh less than 5% of the animal's weight for it to fly normally. Ben Freeman is a life scientist at the Biodiversity Research Center at the University of British Columbia. He says the tracking will help show why the bird population numbers are going down. Better information about migration paths will help us look in the right places. I'm Jill Robbins. Thanks, Jill. In Australia, some really big dinosaur bones were found. Here is Gregory Stockel to tell us more. Scientists say... They have discovered a new dinosaur species in a 10-year study of bones found in Australia. Their research also found that the animal would have been among the biggest of dinosaurs. Pure J, the Journal of Life and Environmental Sciences, published the study findings. Scientists from the Aromanga Natural History Museum and the Queensland Museum did the research. The findings come 17 years after farmers found the bones. The scientists said the dinosaur was a plant-eating sauropod, a kind of dinosaur marked by its large size. The team calls the new species Cooper, a shortening of its scientific name. They say it lived during the Cretaceous period between 92 million and 96 million years ago. At the time, the land now called Australia was attached to Antarctica. Paleontologists, scientists who study dinosaurs, 
estimated the four-legged dinosaur reached a height of 5 to 6.5 meters at the hip. It was 25 to 30 meters in length. This would make it as long as a basketball playing court and as tall as a usual two-level building. The species of dinosaur was the largest ever found in Australia. It puts it in the top five in the world. The other top five largest dinosaurs have been found only in South America. Paleontologists have named the ancient reptile Australotitan cuparensis. Australotitan means southern titan. Cuparensis comes from the name of a small river in the Aromanga area of Queensland. A local family discovered the bones on their cow farm in 2006. Dinosaur bones are very large and heavy, but also fragile or easy to break. It took years to recover the bones. The team from the Aromanga Natural History Museum and the Queensland Museum studied the bones with a new computer technology. The first users, it helped scientists closely compare Cooper's bones to those of other dinosaurs. Scott Hucknall works for the Queensland Museum and is a paleontologist. He said, To make sure Australotitan was a different species, we needed to compare its bones to the bones of other species from Queensland and globally. He said it was a long and difficult process. Robin and Stuart McKenzie were working on their farm when they first discovered ancient bones in 2004. She then established the Euromanga Natural History Museum to hold the finds. Other dinosaur skeletons and a possible sauropod travel path have been discovered in the area also. Study is continuing on those finds. Robin McKenzie is now a paleontologist herself. She said she is expecting many international visitors will come to Euromanga once Australia's borders reopen. Scott Hucknall said that sauropods were hunted by big meat-eating dinosaurs. The bones of that kind of dinosaur are probably in the area, he suggested, adding, We just haven't found it yet. I'm Gregory Stockel. Thanks, Gregory. Finally, here is our American Presidents series with Kelly Jean Kelly. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Millard Fillmore, the 13th President of the United States. Fillmore is also likely the least remembered president. He has been called uninspiring and having only some competence. But Fillmore provided an example of the American dream come true. He rose from a poor family to become a wealthy man. He was elected to Congress four times and nominated for vice president under Zachary Taylor. When Taylor unexpectedly died in office in 1850, Fillmore took his place. Other presidents' campaigns, such as Andrew Jackson's, had spoken proudly of their candidates' modest beginnings. William Henry Harrison's supporters especially linked him with the image of a simple house called a log cabin, even though William Henry Harrison was a wealthy man. But Millard Fillmore really was born in a log cabin. His family was poor. They raised him and his seven brothers and sisters in a rural part of New York State. Fillmore did not receive much education as a child. 
However, he was very interested in learning, so interested that he fell in love with his teacher, Abigail Powers. The two married after he launched his career as a lawyer. They had two children, a son and a daughter. Millard Fillmore soon entered politics. He won elections to the New York State Assembly and then to the U.S. House of Representatives. After eight years in Washington, D.C., Fillmore returned to New York. He failed to be elected governor, but succeeded to become comptroller of New York. In other words, he oversaw the state's finances. At that time, Americans were preparing for another presidential election. President James Polk was retiring from the White House after only one term, as he had promised. The opposition party, the Whigs, nominated Zachary Taylor as their presidential candidate. Taylor, a popular war hero from the South, owned slaves. But the Whigs realized that many anti-slavery voters in the North would not support Taylor. Party leaders were looking for someone to balance the ticket. A northerner voters would consider a friend of business. They found Millard Fillmore. In 1847, the Whigs nominated Fillmore as Taylor's vice president. The two men had never met, and when they did meet, they did not like each other very much. Taylor was short-legged, poorly educated, and rarely seemed concerned about his physical appearance. Fillmore was taller, learned, and elegant. Their personalities did not fit together any better than their appearances did. But a majority of voters liked them. The Whigs won the election, and Fillmore returned to Washington. As vice president, Millard Fillmore was the leader of the Senate. But President Taylor did not seek his advice on the major political issue of the day. At the time, both lawmakers and the public were debating whether the government should, and could, ban slavery in the territories the U.S. had gained after the war with Mexico. In general, Northerners did not want to permit slavery in new states, but many Southerners did. The debate was so heated that one of the Southern states, South Carolina, threatened to leave the Union. President Taylor did not want to expand slavery. To restrict it, he proposed a change to the rules so California and New Mexico could enter the Union quickly as slave-free states. But before Taylor's idea could get too far, he became sick. Fillmore learned the president was not well and prepared for the worst. It came. Taylor died after being in office for only 16 months. The following day, Fillmore was sworn in as president. One of Fillmore's first acts as president was to show where he stood on the slavery issue. He appointed a man who opposed Taylor to Secretary of State. That man, Daniel Webster, and others, wanted to pass a compromise bill on slavery. With Fillmore's support, they succeeded. The Compromise of 1850 included several measures related to slavery. 
two measures limited it. California was admitted as a free state, and the slave trade in Washington, D.C. ended. On the other hand, New Mexico and Utah were left open to slavery, and both the federal government and ordinary citizens were required to return suspected escaped slaves to their owners. That last measure, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, targeted even free African Americans and enslaved people who had escaped to free states. The compromise aimed to end the conflict between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces, but neither side was really satisfied. And President Fillmore did not help matters. He was personally opposed to slavery. However, he did not act on his beliefs. Instead, he tried to keep the South in the Union by strongly enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. By the end of Fillmore's three years in the White House, many members of his Whig party were angry with him. Party leaders did not nominate him again for the next election. But their chosen candidate was not successful either. Fillmore turned out to be the last Whig president. The end of Fillmore's presidency included difficulty in his private life, too. His wife, Abigail, became sick on the day the next president was sworn in. She died within a month. Soon after, Fillmore's daughter died, too. To help deal with their loss, Fillmore tried to stay active in politics. In the presidential election of 1856, Fillmore served as the candidate for a new party, the Know-Nothing Party. The Know-Nothings were strongly opposed to immigration. They especially wanted to limit the number of Irish Catholics who could come to the United States. Fillmore did not agree with the party's anti-immigration policies, but he did not have a chance to put his opinions into policy. Fillmore finished third out of the three major candidates in the election. After that loss, he finally retired to the city of Buffalo, New York. There, Fillmore married a second time to a wealthy widow named Carolyn McIntosh. He remained an important figure in the city's charities and other causes. But the political situation in the country grew only more intense. Americans continued to be divided over the issue of slavery. Fillmore's time in office and his compromise bill may have delayed but did not stop the American Civil War. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that is our program for today. Thank you for listening. Join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.